archiving started. Welcome to the third presentation covering Chapter 4, the chapter that talks about the sources of American law. Um, if you haven't seen the first two, it's okay to jump in on this one, but you'll want to go back and uh, see the first two. It may make a little bit more sense as you've seen these before you see number three. We're going to jump to slide 10 in our presentation, and we're going to talk about the uh, two uh, types of law that we have in our system. We have um, legal courts and we have equitable courts. This was probably the biggest surprise for me when I uh, began law school. I was only familiar with the concept of a legal court, and yet there is a completely separate, or at least historically separate, legal system that we have in a Commonwealth countries, both the United States as well as Great Britain and other countries that were once part of Great Britain. Um, if you've ever read the, the book Bleak House, it talks about um, equitable courts or courts that ex ex excuse me, courts at equity, oftentimes they're called chancery courts. A um, little bit of history about uh, courts at law, courts at equity. Historically, let's go back, say, to uh, 1700. In that year, if you were a plaintiff, and if you were either in Great Britain or the United States, obviously then it wasn't the United States, but the American colonies, um, and you wanted to sue somebody about uh, some kind of claim, you had to make a choice. You either would file your lawsuit in a court at law or a court in equity. If you chose a court at law, you would be eligible to receive monetary damages, cash, I guess uh, British pounds at that time, but anyway, money, if you were successful in your lawsuit. Um, and that is what most people want when they file a lawsuit. They want to get money. That's their goal. And, of course, if that's your goal, then you're going to file a lawsuit in a court of law. But sometimes a court at law is not what you uh, wanted to do. You were interested in equitable remedies. Equitable remedies are non-monetary uh, remedies. These are typically uh, things that the court orders the other side to do or to stop doing. Let me give an example. I'm going to clear the slide for a second. Imagine that you are a farmer and you happen to have your farm right next to this river. Um, I'm going to use my name. I'm going to say this is the Groover Farm. And I use the water from the river to irrigate my crops. So um, it's been working pretty well. Every year I average a profit of $100,000 on my farm. This has been my profit year after year for several, several years. And the water flows this way. This is downstream. Well, upstream of peace, there has recently been built the big bad polluting company, BBPC, and it uh, sends its uh, pollutants into the water supply, and of course, they snake their way down, and then when the pipes from the irrigation system come and irrigate my crops, some of those bad chemicals get into my plants, and so even though I've been getting $100,000 year after year in my profit this last year, instead of getting $100,000, I only got a profit of $10,000, a dramatic reduction in profit. And there's no um, reason to account for this other than the pollution that the big bad polluting company is sending into the water supply. There was normal weather. There was normal rainfall. Uh, everything seemed to be online for me to get my usual $100,000 in profit. So I want to sue Big Bad Polluting Company. And if I were just interested in money, I could sue them for the difference between what I should have earned, 100000 and what I, in fact, did earn, uh, 10000 So I could sue for $90,000. Um, but that doesn't really solve my problem because if I just sue for $90,000, it's not going to stop the Big Bad Polluting Company from continuing to put bad chemicals in the water supply. So every year I'm going to have to sue again, and every year I'll be able to get $90,000, $90, but that doesn't really solve the problem. And in fact, over time, it might be such that um, my uh, level of profit is going to decline, and maybe after enough pollutants have been introduced to my crops, it may be that my land itself is unfarmable, that it's not a fixable problem, at least in the short term. So while money is nice, it's not the only thing that I might find a value. I might want to sue at equity. Um, and what I might want to do is to get a court order, a writ. A writ is a fancy word for a court order. And you can see when you see the word writ that it looks like the beginning of the word right or written. 
And so obviously a writ or court order is going to be written. That's one way of remembering what it is. So a writ is just a court order. An example of a writ that you can use in an, in an equitable court is an injunction. The court can enjoin the defendant, of course, to mean that the plaintiff wins, of course, can enjoin the um, uh, defendant from doing something. And this can mean it can order the defendant, hey, you can't put those chemicals into the river. Or so it can be a negative statement, stop doing this or don't do this. Or it can be a positive statement. You need to put scrubbers on your factory so that uh, the chemicals don't get released into the water supply. So it can be either a positive statement or a negative statement. And if the defendant chooses not to abide by the writ, the court order, in this case an injunction, then he is in contempt of court and he's going to face the wrath of the court once that is established. So when do you look for an injunction type relief versus monetary damages? When is the plaintiff going to be focusing on equity instead of money or at law? Well, first of all, when monetary damages are inadequate. In my example, uh, the problem is going to recur, recur, recur. So mon money doesn't really solve my problem. I mean, I like it. I like to have more rather than less, but it does not stop me from having a problem in the long run. There may also be ideas of justice and fairness in the matter. Um, uh, courts at equity uh, kind of apply a different standard than courts at law. We think about courts at law um, applying pretty rigid let me actually do this on a so if we think about a court at law here I'm going to draw a little thing so let's think about this as a court at law and this is a court at equity so one of the differences is damages and as you said before law gives money and equity gets writs gets some kind of injunction, something other than money. So there's also the standard that is applied. I'm going to call the legal standard rigid. That sounds like a criticism, but actually it's not. Just maybe not the best word choice, but it uh, kind of conveys the idea. An equitable standard is more flexible. I'll give you an example of that. An example of a rigid standard is a statute of limitations. Let's imagine that you punch me in the nose and I'm going to file a lawsuit. Well, in the state of Texas, I have three years to file a lawsuit for a punch on the nose, we'll say, for the sake of argument. And so let's say that um, I wait until three years one day to file my lawsuit. And you, when you get served with a lawsuit, you recognize that I waited one day too late to file my lawsuit. Well, you're just going, even though you fully admit that you punched me in the nose and you caused me this injury, and that if you had, I had filed my lawsuit in time, you'd have to pay me lots and lots of money. But because I was one day late, you can tell the court, Your Honor, this lawsuit is too late. I don't have to respond to it. Plaintiff can't win under those circumstances. That's a rigid rule. Now, there are even in the legal situations ways around that sometimes, but it's designed to be a pretty clear, pretty well-defined cutoff. One day before, I would have been fine. One day after, I don't have a claim. Um, equity, though, is a little bit different. Instead of having a emphasis upon a statute of limitations, they emphasize latches. They're not so much focused on a, that a particular date is one day too long or one day too short. They're focusing on what efforts did I take? Um, was I working really, really hard to get my lawsuit filed and just I encountered all kinds of obstacles? And was the defendant um, somehow prejudiced by my delay or, or was the delay having no effect upon the uh, defendant? For example, in a latches case, let's use the same example and let's assume that I waited um, three years and one day. Well, it just so happens that the witness in the case, your prime witness, had just passed away, had been suffering from a long illness, and we all knew this person was not going to be around forever, and this witness would have likely testified that, no, in fact, you did not punch me in the nose, and I'm making up the whole story. But I waited until that person passed away, so that person would be unavailable to testify on your behalf. So in that situation, you could argue that you were prejudiced by my unreasonable delay. And so you're making more of a, I'm going to call it a loosey-goosey, very technical term here, as you can imagine, loosey-goosey standard, more flexible standard. 
Now, I made this sound when I was talking about rigid and flexible as if, well, of course, who doesn't want to be flexible? Who doesn't value flexibility over rigidness? I mean, just think about yoga. That's what you're going for, for flexibility. Nobody takes exercises to become more rigid, right? But rigidity is not a bad thing in the law because it means that there's predictability, that people know what the standard is. And if I know what I'm supposed to do and I know I have to follow it in three years, well, guess what? I'm going to follow it in three years 99.99% of the time. It gives people the ability to plan their lives based upon the standard that exists. Yes, whenever you have a rigid standard, there's going to be times that you look at and go, gee, what's that? It would be nice if it could be a little bit more flexible, right? Yeah, but as soon as you start being flexible, then where do you stop? It's kind of that um, slippery slope argument. But the courts of equity are much more flexible. They're much more willing to look at the big picture to see how this is actually playing out under these particular circumstances. Of course, the downside to a, a flexible standard is, well, um, my idea about what's fair may be different than what the judge's idea is fair. And certainly my, the plaintiff's idea about what is fair is definitely going to be different than what the defendant's idea of what fair is. So it allows a lot of a human uh a subjective evaluation of the circumstances, and therefore courts at equity are inherently less predictable than courts at law. Um, now, if you have case, if you have a case in which you, as a plaintiff, have a weak case at law, you might want to go to a court at equity simply because you stand a better chance at being successful. So, those are some key differences between courts at law and courts at equity. I'm going to go back to um, this picture. Um, another, uh, we talked about injunctions as being one alternative in a court equity. The other is a specific performance. A specific performance is not about going to the theater and enjoying a good play. Um, when we talk about performance here, we're not talking about art. We're talking about performing a certain task. An example of specific performance would be if um, um, I uh, contracted with you to uh, buy a car that you have. Let's say it's a well. Let, let's say it's a it's a unique Monet painting, and I have agreed to pay you ten million dollars, and you have contracted to deliver this Monet painting to me. And you change your mind, and you go, well, you know what? You still have your ten million dollars. So really, what's the big harm in me not doing what I promised I would do? Well, I want that painting. Maybe since the time I negotiated the contract with you, the value of that painting has gone up from ten million to fifteen million dollars, and I'd like to. Uh, take possession of the painting after, of course, paying you $10 million and then flip it and sell it to somebody else for $15 million. Or maybe I just love Monet's and I really, really want this uh, specific painting. It's a unique piece of art. Well, courts are somewhat reluctant to order specific performance. They prefer to just work it out with money. But if it's something that's truly unique, like a uh, one-of-a-kind piece of art, then they may require that you perform your duties under the terms of the contract, meaning you have to give me the painting, again, for the negotiated price that we talked about. That's an example of specific performance. Um, in the uh, mid-1800s, courts at law and courts of equity typically merged. And, of course, we became a republic in the mid-1880s, um, excuse me, 1830s, um, so uh, that trend was beginning to happen in uh, the United States and elsewhere, and uh, I think rather wisely our founding fathers decided not to even have two systems of courts initially, that we merged a courts at law and courts at equity from the very beginning. So in fact, they weren't really merged here. They were it was always in one court system. And that is very advantageous for plaintiffs because now plaintiffs can go to one courtroom. They don't have to choose. Before they had to say, do I want money more? Or do I want the specific performance or injunctive more? But now they get to have both. They file in a court of law because it's the only kind that exists, but they can pursue equitable remedies as well as legal remedies. Um, so that's the system that we have. There are still some jurisdictions in the United States that does, have not merged their law and equity systems. The one that immediately comes to mind is the Delaware court system. And this is pretty famous because this is, you probably heard about a lot of different large companies that might incorporate in the state of Delaware. For example, J.C. Penney is incorporated in the state of De Delaware. It's a very common state for incorporation. Well, the courts that um, are involved in corporate uh, registration and disputes along those lines are, is the Delaware Court of Chancery, which, guess what, is an equitable court. So equitable courts still do exist, notably in Delaware, but some other places as well. But not in Texas. We only have one court system. 
but it's important to know about the distinction between law and equity because it does continue to have an important uh, effect upon how you plead things, how you approach the law in this area, um, uh, what remedies are available to you depending upon the particular claims that you are advancing in your case. One thing to remember is that both courts at law and courts at equity deal with the common law. Ec the equity system is part of the common law, but it can also be statutory. So it's not different than or something other than the common law. Judges have created equitable concepts, and also legislatures have applied equitable concepts in establishing remedies available to people, to plaintiffs who are suing. Let's go to the next slide. Well, we'll cover these in class, so I'll go to the next one. Here is um, a list of some differences between courts at law and courts at equity. So we have the initiation of a lawsuit in a court at law that traditionally would be called a complaint. This is actually the term that is used in federal court today, whether or not the uh, um, plaintiff is seeing, seeking equitable relief or legal relief. You always follow, call it a complaint. Traditionally, in a court of equity, you would file something called a petition. In the state of Texas, again, whenever you're filing a lawsuit in state court, whether you're seeking equitable or legal results, you're going to call it a petition. So in our system, since it's merged, we don't have these name differences, but this is kind of just a historical artifact. You can see, see even the names that we use, that some of that legacy is still in place. When you see the term complaint, um, it really suggests this is the beginning acts, um, event in a lawsuit. This is what lets the court know that the plaintiff's mad about something. So it, it makes sense that you call it a complaint. After all, the plaintiff is complaining about what has transpired in this matter. He's saying something has gone wrong and I want you to fix it, Your Honor. So it is a complaint. But the word petition also makes sense too because when you petition somebody, you are asking them, hey, please, please fix this. So they both have the same notion, I guess it's a little bit more maybe polite way of saying it, but with whichever term you're using, that idea comes across. When you look at the word complaint, you see here at the end the word plaint, which of course is related to the word plaintiff, the person who is initiating the lawsuit. And of course sometimes in courts you see the petition, the person following the petition referred to as the petitioner the person who is petitioning the court. So they can also be called the plaintiff. This is a, an important distinction, too, is who makes the decision? Who hears the evidence? Well, in a court at law, typically it's going to be the jury who decides whether the plaintiff wins or the defendant wins, and it's also going to be the jury that decides if, if the jury has found that the plaintiff wins, how much the plaintiff wins. Sometimes you have a, a judge trial. This is called a bench trial. Um, but the, the default setting, or, or not say the default setting, the usual result is going to be a jury trial. Now, the plaintiff or the defendant has to specifically request a jury trial. If no request is made, then there will be a bench trial, or judge will decide it. But um, most of the time, you're going to have a jury trial. However, when you have an action in equity, the judge decides it all alone. And it may seem a little funny that you would have no jury in these types of matters, but when you think about it, it makes sense, because think about it. A court order has to issue. Well, who makes a court order? Guess what? A judge. Also, a court order isn't just a, a, a form where he, you say, this guy wins and this is how much money to turn over. It involves a lot of very technical, specific language that has to be drafted with a great deal of care and attention and is usually best drafted by a legal professional. Going back to my example, the Big Bad Polluting Company, when you are going to enjoin them from putting uh, pollution into the water, you have to describe what that pollution is. Um, I'm sure there's many things that they'll be able to put into the water stream. For example, they could put H2O into the water stream, and that wouldn't cause any harm. But it might be that water at a certain temperature might cause harm, or water with certain chemicals in it might cause harm. And, and so you'd have to define, number one, uh, what chemicals are prohibited, what amount of those chemicals are prohibited, um, what temperature the water has to be at, all of those things is going to require a lot of precision. If they're written imprecisely, the Big Bad Polluting Company may be able to find some wiggle room around the rules, or maybe they're not going to be able to know exactly what they're supposed to do in a poorly written court order. Um, they're not going to be able to be found to be in contempt of it if contempt of it if they didn't know how to comply with it. So it makes sense to have that judge, that legal professional, actually draft it so it is airtight. So that's why juries are not as involved in this process. 
The result, what happens, in a court of law is called a judgment. In a court of equity is called a decree. Now, I'll tell you, usually you hear the word judgment nowadays, whether it's a, the court is acting as a court of law or a court of equity. But you'll occasionally hear the term decree. But this distinction, kind of like this distinction, really no longer separates an action at law from an action at equity. This, though, continues to be an ongoing distinction. And then, of course, the remedy also continues to be an ongoing distinction between courts at law and courts at equity. And you have, of course, uh, the monetary damages. And then here are two examples of equitable remedies, an injunction or a decree of specific performance. These are not the only two remedies that are available in a court of equity, but these are two examples of remedies that are available. In other courses, uh, federal civil litigation, you'll likely hear about some additional um, remedies that can be available. Um, so the main things I want you to take away from are the differences in remedy and also who makes the decision here. Is it a judge or jury or is it just a judge? Let's go to the next slide. And we will talk about this one in class. I'm going to go to the next one after that. Ah, we'll talk about this one also in class. Uh, you may, By the way, you may want to look at these and develop an opinion about what you think the answer is going to be and bring them to class and we'll talk about those in more detail at that time. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about um, the common law. We're going to also connect that common law tradition to a statutory law tradition. And as we've talked about, you know, there is no country that only has common law or only has, or only has case law or only has statutory law. Um, any country is going to have a combination of those. If you imagine this is all the laws in a particular country, a common law country might be, you know, having cases being the dominant source of law and just some statutes, so called statutes, statutes. Then there might be another country that has very little cases, or at least the cases are much less important, and lots of statutes. We would typically call this system a common law country, like the United States and Great Britain. And we would call a, co a country that has, I'm um, hoping this is showing up on the, the, the uh, rockets. Let me actually clear the slide to make sure that I'm showing you this picture because I'm not sure what shows up and then on the screen and those things are below. If we have a system like this where case law is a relatively small part and statutes are a big part, and this is another system where statutes are a small part and case law is a big part, then this would be a civil law tradition and this would be a common law tradition. One isn't better than the other. They're just different ways of setting up your legal system. Um, for the most part, the only countries that have a common law tradition are countries that were once part of Great Britain. So you find the United States, Great Britain, Ireland, Canada, India, um, some of the um, Caribbean islands, Australia, um, some African countries, they have common law traditions. Um, if the country is a continental European country or a country that used to be a colony of a continental European country, or most countries in Asia, you'll find that they have a civil tradition. Case law is much less important than statutes have, um, are. I think a, a little history might help make this make a little bit more sense. Um, when Napoleon Bonaparte uh, became uh, the leader of France, as you know, he had a very um, aggressive plan to kind of take over Europe and even take over Great Britain. And so he was interested in figuring out a way, I'm just going to make a tremendously detailed map of Europe here, call this Europe, or at least Western Europe. And here he is over here in France. And he is invading countries right and left. You know, he's invading Spain and Portugal and, well, I guess I should have made France down here, shouldn't I? Okay, not so much for my geography, but... Um, um, also, we have Italy down here, and we have, you know, uh, Belgium, and we've got Germany, and we've got Scandinavia, and lots of different parts of the country. And guess what? They all speak different languages. No other country is going to have that many French speakers. I guess Belgium would. But other than that, certainly in Spain, they're going to be speaking um, Spanish. In Portugal, they're going to be speaking Portuguese, et cetera, et cetera. And they're also going to have somewhat different traditions. Most people in France were Roman Catholics at that time. Um, certainly that would be true for Spain, Portugal, and Italy, but you'd find in parts of Germany and in Scandinavia that there's going to be a lot of Protestants. And so uh, 
uh, Napoleon was looking for some uh, ties that are, was going to unite his empire. And one of those things that he alighted upon as a good source of commonality would be to have a similar legal system. So he asked his legal scholars to come up with uh, the Napoleonic Code. And this would be a set of uh, laws that he would be able to apply throughout his empire. And so whether you were a Spanish-speaking Catholic or a German-speaking Protestant, you would be under the same legal tradition, the same part of this empire. And, of course, these countries before, these, maybe not even the whole country, but portions of the countries would have their own legal tradition uh, that they had had probably for hundreds of years prior to that time. And very likely they weren't... Um, statutory, but they developed much like um, the common law tradition developed in Great Britain. But um, they began to adopt this, this common law tradition. It was kind of imposed upon them from the outside, but it became a unifying force of this empire. And so, of course, at some point, Napoleon owned uh, the, the territories that France had owned in the New World, Louisiana, for example. And um, uh, obviously, Napoleon had taken over uh, Spain and and the uh, the colonies that were part of uh, the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire. And so the New World, other than the parts that were controlled by Great Britain, came under this civil law tradition that was very statutory and much less em emphasis upon the common law or the uh, case law. And so the, the big difference is, imagine that you were uh, Napoleon's, one of his chief uh, legal scholars. And so he's charged you with the job of writing a very systematic, tight code that would anticipate as many possible problems as you could. We'd start out sim systematically and you'd think about this issue and then this issue and then this issue and then this issue and then this issue. And you'd try to leave very few blanks. I mean, you wouldn't be able to anticipate every problem. Maybe you'd not think about this issue right here. Uh, but you'd be able to, because you're smart and because you study this and think about this a long time, you'd be able to answer a lot of questions. And so you wouldn't need a lot of case law because you would have anticipated this in your statute. But in Great Britain, there never was this moment where they decided to systematically codify their law. They started with kind of a blank uh, a sheet. The judges would have to invent the law because there wasn't this legislature that was passing laws right and left. And so when they encountered a problem, they said, this is how we're going to solve it. Oh, new problem. We're going to have to solve this. Oh, new problem. We're going to have to solve this. So it wasn't systematic. It was a solve a problem as it came up. And as a result, if this particular area never came up, there would not be any solution. Uh, no court would have developed it, and the legislature probably didn't think about it. Now, over time, of course, in Great Britain and the United States, legislatures became more robust. They started doing more things. But even in that system, they didn't really sit down and try to develop the systematic writing of all the various – they didn't try to solve every problem. They were still kind of solving problems as they came up. As a particular topic was of interest to a legislator, he would pass a law about it. But it didn't mean that he was necessarily guaranteed that he was going to address this particular issue right here. So that is – in, in, in short order, the differences between the civil tradition and the common law tradition. Now, as a result of the uh, systematic nature of the civil tradition, case law isn't that important. You still have judges. You still have to somebody, uh, have people that will rule on the decisions because you'll have to look at uh, the, the, the way the facts interplay with the statute. But a judge in a civil law country doesn't really have to pay that much attention to precedent. He's looking at the statute. The fact that another judge has faced a similar case and has interpreted the same statute doesn't really bind the, the judge that you're in front of nearly to the extent. I mean, he may consider it, but precedent is not nearly as important as it is in our system because they don't need it. They've got almost all of the answers findable in the statute. So let's go back to... Um, the differences between statutory law and common law. Of course, in our system, you're going to find, as I said before, you're going to find that there's a lot more statutes. There's a lot more areas of the law that has been filled in. We have a full-time federal legislature. Um, the congressmen and senators um, are, that's all they do. That's what they, their, their job is, to pass laws. And so, naturally, they're passing a lot of them. And maybe they're good laws, maybe they're bad laws, but they're definitely happening. Even in state legislatures where uh, many of the senators and representatives are not full-time, 
Um, they're still in session pretty often in Texas. We're somewhat unusual that we only we only are in session every other year. But even though it's true we're only in session every other year, it's not uncommon for the governor to call special sessions. So it ends up being more like every year, at least to some portion of the year. So there's more and more blanks being filled in, but there's still these gaps, still this area where there's nothing. Um, common law governs all areas not covered by statutory law. This is an important concept, and I'm going to pause and say this again because it's easy to get confused on this. Several, I've, I've had many students who haven't picked up on this point, so um, if it's helpful, go back and listen to this a couple times. Once the legislature passes a law, it doesn't matter what the common law was the day before. It's no longer the common law. That common law tradition has been completely and irrevocably replaced by a statute. Statutory law always trumps common law. And it's like the, that common law didn't even exist because the legislature gets to decide. What case law is, what common law is, is just a fill in until the legislature acts. It's a, uh, gee whiz, we don't know what the legislature would do, but we just have to give it our best guess. But as soon as the legislature tells the courts, then the courts are going to follow that. So um, that is the notion that we have here. Common law governs until there's a statute. Now, of course, even after there's a statute, let's go back to our example. Um, say there's a, there's a there's a statute in this area and you have a case that comes up and you're the judge, you're still going to have to apply the law to the fact pattern. You're going to have to find whether the law itself is constitutional. You may have to interpret it. Maybe it's ambiguous or you have to at least apply it to the facts. So it doesn't mean that the judge isn't doing important things even when there's a statute. All it means is the judge isn't making law. He's interpreting law. He's applying the law to the particular facts that this case faces. So let's go forward. Let's look at some terminology that applies to case law. Um, when we see the name of a case, um, let me go to the next slide so you can see this. Here we have the name of a case, Smith versus Jones. You have the first name, then you have, of course, it's cap going to be capitalized, then you have a lowercase v with a period, and then you're going to have a second name. Uh, typically, the way a case is described, you're not going to you're going to list the first plaintiff's name and then the first defendant's name. So it might have been Smith, Bob Smith, and Mary Green suing Harry Jones and Megan um, White. Well, in this situation, you cut off the first name and you cut off any of the names other than the first and you end up with Smith and Jones. You can underline it. That's a common approach. Or you can italicize it. Either one is correct. You only do one or the other. But that this is the example of a case name. Um, in the trial court, the first name is going to be the plaintiff's name. He's the one who started this case, so his name goes first. And then the second name is going to be the defendant's name when you're in the trial court. When you are in an appeal, though, you can't tell by the order of the names who filed the lawsuit. Let me explain, because there's two different ways that appellate courts treat the name of a case. What they can do is they can keep the plaintiff's name always first, so the, the case name will stay the same. It'll be If it was Smith & Jones at the trial level, it would be Smith & Jones on appeal. But there's an argument to be made that that makes sense because it, you know everyone's used to calling it Smith and Jones, so why uh, confuse people by changing the word order? But then some courts take the position: well, let's assume that def that the defendant here is the one filing the appeal, so it's really not Smith versus Jones anymore. It's the defendant who's ticked off at what happened in the trial court. So then it really should be the defendant versus the plaintiff. So instead of being Smith versus Jones, because Jones is the one filing the appeal, it now ought to be Jones versus Smith. Um, and so the takeaway is unless you know the rule in the particular appellate court that you're appearing in, you can't tell by just looking at the style of the case or the name of the case, in other words, that it's a style, um, whether the first name is the plaintiff or the first name is the appellant or the person filing the appeal. Um, the names of the, the parties to the case, the person filing the lawsuit, the person with the complaint is the plaintiff. And we talked before about how you see lurking in the word complaint, or in Texas it would be called petition, but the same idea, is plaintiff. And then the defendant is the person who's defending himself. He's trying to avoid 
um, having to pay money. He's in the defensive position. He's trying to say, oh, no, no, it didn't happen the way you said it did. I shouldn't have to do anything. Um, so you could say the plaintiff is on the offense and the defendant is on the defense. Many times legal professionals will use the pi sign to refer to the plaintiff. And you can see, obviously, plaintiff starts with a P. Greek is the pi, or a pi is the Greek letter for P, so that's kind of the logic behind that. Delta, or the triangle, is the Greek letter for D. If you know that sororities, uh, tri-delta, tri delta, 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 that D, D, D. That, of course, reminds us of the fact that the word defendant starts with the D. So um, if you see these two signs, that's the history of that. It's very commonly done by legal professionals. And then erase this here. And let's talk about how judges function at this level. Well, um, at a trial court, there's only one judge. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, um, there's a lot of trial courts, and if we had to hire more than one judge for each trial court, it would cost us, the taxpayers, lots of money. Uh, the way our judicial system is set up is that, yes, the plaintiff has to file some fees to start the lawsuit, but the vast, vast majority of money that it costs to maintain a judicial system is paid for by you and me, the taxpayers, people who probably will have very little uh, basis or very little use personally for the judicial system. So naturally, we want a good deal with it. We know we need one, but we don't want to spend more money than we have to. So it makes sense to only have one judge here. But there's other reasons why you only want one judge. Imagine that you're at trial. You have 12 jurors who have taken time off from their lives uh, to do something that's probably kind of boring for them. They're not getting any money for it. Many times their employer won't be paying them for the income that they lost. So they're they're kind of in a pickle. They're kind of being significantly inconvenienced. And then you have a judge there. If you had three judges, imagine the amount of delay that you would have. Every time an objection is made, the three judges would have to uh, talk amongst themselves. And if you get three judges together, you're going to get at least three different opinions. And so there's going to be a lot of, well, I don't agree with that. Well, I don't agree with that. And so instead of having a quick decision from a single judge um, within moments of the objection being made, you might have a 30-minute delay every time an objection is made. That would make that would make the trial take a lot longer. It would cause the jury to be a lot more bored, and it would be difficult for the jury to keep track of with all these interruptions and, and uh, uh, breaks to the flow of the trial. So it makes sense to only have one judge. Now, of course, when you only have one judge, um, there is an increased risk that that one judge will get something wrong. After all, no judge is an expert in every single area of the law, and sometimes the objections that are made during trial couldn't have been anticipated by the judge. And most of the time, he's going to make a quick decision. I mean, occasionally he'll say, oh, I need to go to chambers and think about that. But um, he again recognizes the jury's being inconvenient, so it's kind of his job to make the quick call. Well, guess what? He doesn't always know what the right answer is, or maybe he thinks he knows what the right answer is, but he's not always right. You know, it's kind of like a baseball player or, or batter who hits um, uh, 300. That's only hitting one out of three, right, or actually less than that. That's considered a good batting average or a very good batting average. But, you know, if you only get one out of three and on a test, that's not a very good record. Well, if you have a judge who gets 90% of it right, that's pretty good. That's an A. Uh, but, of course, that means that he misses 10% of the time. So he's going to make mistakes. That's one of the reasons why we have appellate courts, Right. So we only have one judge in this system, but once you appeal the case, you're going to be in a panel of three judges who are going to hear the case. They're randomly selected from the court. Um, that particular court might have 20 or more judges on it, but three are selected for each particular panel to hear a particular case. Um, you need to have an odd number, obviously, because if you had an even number, they could be an even split and you wouldn't have a resolution of the case. So you're going to have, whenever, whatever court system you're in, you're going to have an odd number. One in this case, three in this case, nine in this case. Um, you may think, well, why do we have three judges in the appellate court system? Well, first of all, only about 10% of cases are appealed. So it's a lot less expensive to have three judges on an appellate court than it would be to have three judges on a trial court because you need to have a lot fewer of those judges. Secondly, there isn't the urgency of this case. The case has been decided. The jury has gone home. They're not being held hostage throughout this time. The only people that are being inconvenienced by the delay are the plaintiff and the defendant. So it's not nearly as much of a concern to have a, a additional delay for the, the three judges to talk over the case and mull over the concepts. Another reason that you have three judges as opposed to one is that at a trial court level, 
the judge really isn't establishing precedent. His opinions aren't going to become published. I mean, they might be known around the courthouse, but they're not going to be something that's going to be cited as precedent in other cases. But an appellate court, its opinions are going to get published, and those decisions are going to be used in other cases that have nothing to do with a particular plaintiff or picture of defendant in this case. So the panel of three judges, yes, they're concerned about doing justice for the plaintiff and the defendant that are before it in that particular case. But they're probably more concerned about establishing a good precedent for the jurisprudence of the state of Texas. They're thinking long term, not just with respect to these individual litigants. So it's really important they get the right answer. And the idea is, you know, if two heads are better than one, well, three heads are better than one as well. So that's the idea. The highest court, and this is would apply to the U.S. Supreme Court, as well as the Texas Supreme Court, as well as the Texas Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which is our highest court for criminal matters. All three of these courts have nine justices on it. Um, and all nine justices hear every case, assuming they haven't recused themselves for uh, some reason, such as they have some involvement in the case or have some financial stake with respect to the case. Um, so, again, it's an odd number. Um, so you can have a 5, 4, 6, 3, 7, 2, 8, 1, or 9, 0 decision. Um, and so this is the highest court, all the justices here. You are automatically entitled, you, the uh, a, a appealing party, the appellant, entitled as a matter of right to your first appeal. But every appeal after that are at the discretion of that highest court. We'll have to learn more about this um, in subsequent parts of the case. And we'll go over these true-false questions um, in class. Let's talk about the adversarial system. Our system is adversarial. Um, no big surprise there. You can see by the name Smith versus Jones. It's almost like a boxing fight. And that's not entirely a bad analogy, to be honest with you. It's definitely adversary, mano a mano. Uh, it's a winner take all in many cases. There's not about compromise. Um, the judge and the jury decides, and Smith wants to maximize his win, and Joan wants to manage, maximize his win. Uh, the adversarial system is designed, or at least the plan at least, is that because Smith is highly motivated to be a zealous advocate for his case, because he wants to get as much money from Jones as he can, and Jones is highly motivated to be the best advocate for his case, he wants to give as little money as he can to Smith, that they're both going to present the best arguments. They're both going to research the law carefully and uncover every single case that helps their case, every single statute that helps their statute, every single fact and witness and piece of evidence that's going to help them at all. And so because they're both focused on the win, they're going to develop the law in the best possible way so the judge knows all the best arguments. And so he is in the best position to make the best decision, which we're going to advance the jurisprudence for the whole um uh, state or country, whatever the uh, jurisdiction might be. Now, uh, the adversarial system makes perfect sense to us, but it's not inevitable that you'd have this system. Um, adversarialness is, is a component, I think, of every legal system to some extent, but there are other systems that are less adversarial uh, that might, might focus on compromise more. For example, you might have judges that actually were involved in investigating the facts. The judges might be asking witnesses questions. The judges might be independently investigating the facts um, with the idea of, well, I'm interested in doing justice. I'm not just interested in hearing what both sides think is justice. I want to independently figure out what justice is. Uh, those, th those systems can work. They can be good systems. Uh, for example, Japan has some of those elements in its system, but it just doesn't happen to be our system. It would be considered highly inappropriate for jurors or judges to independently investigate the facts. Now we'll go over the true-false in class. Let's talk about, this will be the last slide that we cover today, or in this uh, presentation, let's talk about some of the terminology. We'll talk more about this when you get to legal research, which is LGLA 1303. We talked about the name of the case. We talked about the example of Smith versus Jones, the plaintiff's surname versus the defendant's surname. There's lots of different names. So you can call this the case title, the case name, or you can call it the style of the case. Um, that's not a very intuitive name there, um, but it's 
perhaps the most common name for it. So if you hear someone say, what's the style of the case? They're talking about this. Smith versus Jones or ABC Electronics versus um, DEF Incorporated or whatever. You can also refer to it as a caption. Also, sometimes the caption is interpreted to mean um, a larger part of the lawsuit title. These are all synonyms. You can use them fairly interchangeably. Again, this is the order of the style when it is in trial court. Again, as we've said before, the names of the cases may be reversed on appeal or they may not be, depending upon the practices in that particular appellate court. Let's talk about the citation. This is where you find a published case. This is, um, let's say Smith versus Jones was litigated and got to an appellate court, and the appellate court issued an opinion. You'd want to find that opinion to cite it. This is an example of a citation. The first set of numbers gives you the volume number. The second tells you the particular reporter. Texas cases, state cases, are published in the Southwestern Reporter Series. This is a fact that you'll want to know. Keep this in mind. It will, you will see this at some point in your legal academic career on or perhaps a uh, performance measurement device, hint, hint. Um, we have the Southwestern Reporter, we have the Southwestern Reporter 2nd, and we have the Southwestern Reporter 3rd. And this is the name of the, 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 the volume series. There's also a Southern Reporter, a Pacific Reporter, a Northeastern Reporter, an Atlantic Reporter, um, a Pacific Reporter. There's lots of different names for this. But this is the one that covers Texas and also covers several other states. And then this last number gives you the page that the particular opinion begins on. So this helps the reader of whatever you're writing know where this case is. We already said that trial courts have only one judge and appellate courts have um, three judges. There's also something called en banc. I didn't talk about this before. Let's imagine that we are in front of an appellate court um, in front of those three judges and we lose. But we think to ourselves, you know what? We think we just had a bad draw, that the three judges on our panel are just kind of out there. Their political views are not political. Their judicial views are out of the mainstream. And we think the vast majority of the judges in this particular appellate uh, court would side with us. Well, we can request an en banc review. I said earlier that a lot of the terms that we use in um, the law are, are Latin, but this case is French. And you may remember that the Normans invaded France in 10, sorry, the Normans invaded England in 1066 um, uh, when the Conqueror invaded. And so for, for hundreds of years, uh, French was the language of the court system as well as uh, the language of the, uh, uh, the the court in the sense of the, the king and the queen in the, the palace and, and the, the things that happened uh, there, but certainly in the judicial court system as well. So this is one of those remaining um, aspects of, of that terminology. So you see here en banc means uh, from the bench. Um, in other words, all of the judges would opine. Now, you can request en banc review, um, but it's rarely granted because you can imagine how inconvenient it is to get all the judges together. It's likely only going to be granted when the other judges kind of agree with you. Hey, wait a second. What, is this? what are these three idiots doing? Why do they make this ruling? Let's look at the term opinion. The opinion is the decision of the court. Um, it's going to be written, and it's going to include the reasoning of the court, not only what the court is deciding, what's going to happen to Smith, what's going to happen to Jones, but also why it's happening, what the, the rationale is, what statute is the court relying upon, what cases is the court replying, relying on. If it's an appellate court, there may be multiple opinions. Um, there could be a unanimous opinion. Obviously, if it's unanimous, you know all of the justices agree. So if it's a Court of Appeals, it's a 3-0 verdict. If it's a um, Texas Supreme Court, a U.S. Supreme Court decision, it's a 9-0 verdict. If it's majority, it means that a majority of the court, meaning two of the three or five or six or seven or eight of the nine, uh, have signed off on that particular opinion. Of course, if there's a majority opinion, it means there isn't a unanimous opinion, so it means that somebody either dissented, in other words, disagreed with uh, what the majority opinion thinks should have won. Let's say the majority opinion says Smith should win. Yay for Smith, winner. Well, maybe uh, in that situation, if some of the justices said, no, Jones should win, that would be a dissent. But sometimes you might have a concurring opinion. And this arises when 
Some of the justices, yeah, we agree Smith ought to win, so we agree with the majority's conclusion, but we would arrive at that conclusion in a different way. Our reasoning is different. So we agree with the end, but we don't agree with the means. That would be in a concurrence or a concurring opinion. Let's look at the category of a, a plurality. And I am going to clear this slide and show an example of how a plurality works. I'm going to list, using numbers, nine justices, just by numbers. And I'm going to say that six vote to affirm. And when we say affirm, we mean they are, they're saying that the Court of Appeals got it right. They're saying, yay, yay, Court of Appeals, you score an A+. Plus. And the bottom three would vote to reverse. They say, hey, Court of Appeals, you messed up big time. I, we don't agree with you. Let's say amongst the six that vote to affirm, four um, will sign off on Justice One's opinion. So, so Justice One writes opinion, two, three, and four agree. Justice 5, though, agrees to affirm, but would do it on a different basis. And 6 signs Judge Judge's 5 opinion. On the reversal, we have 7 rights in opinion, but he's, he's a loner. He's the only one who signed off on that. Justice 8 signed, has a separate uh, dissent, and Justice 9 signs off on that. So let's go through here. Well, we know we don't have a unanimous opinion because we have 6 that vote to affirm, 3 that vote to reverse. We also, though, don't have a majority opinion because the most that we have is four, two, one, and two. This is four is less than nine. So this is going to be the plurality opinion. It's on the winning side. It's on the affirmance, affirming side. And it's the most, has the most numerous signatures here. So it's the plurality, but it's not a majority. A majority and a unanimous opinion have, are very strong precedents. Um, but a plurality is pretty darn weak because you don't have even a majority of the court agreeing with a particular view. So um, courts don't want to issue plurality opinions. They want to figure out a way. So you can bet this justice here who's writing this opinion uh, tried to coax five and or six to join his side because if one of these had joined, then they would have not a plurality four, but they would have had five. But somehow or another, they just couldn't make that happen. Now, five and six form a concurrence. They agree with the plurality. And, of course, this could have been a majority. You can have a concurrence with the plurality or with the majority. They agree with the outcome, but they derive it in a different way. And then these two opinions are dissents. Now, you don't call a dissent a plurality dissent or anything like that. It's just a dissent. You can have lots of them. I guess you could have four in theory. Um, and you can have more than one concurrence. It could be that five and six decide each issue their own opinion, so you could have two uh, concurrences in this case. But that's how that works. If this isn't making sense to you, we'll do some of these in class. Um, and uh, you're welcome to come to office hours for more examples about how to make this make sense. Okay. So let me go back to here. Um, that explains how uh, majority, plurality, concurring, dissenting, and unanimous opinion work. In our next presentation, we will start talking about the constitutional law. So be, I know it seems like we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about case law. The rest of the chapter goes quite a bit faster. So I'm going to end the lecture now. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, please raise them in class. We'll be happy to talk about those. Uh, thank you for your time. Bye-bye.